Do it. No, you're good. Well, all right then. Good morning, everybody. Wayne English here with the DSC University, and I have along with me Dennis Wilkins. Dennis, how are you doing this morning? Good, man. How are you? I'm oh, looking forward to this. Something yeah. new. Something new. First time I've ever done it, so hopefully it's going to go good. Hopefully there's uh, plenty of people out there taking a look at this, and we'll post it on the YouTube channel so it can be seen later. So hopefully it's going to go well, and we can do many more of these. I appreciate yeah. your help. Yeah, man. Thanks a lot for coming along. Dennis is going to be running. The YouTube side of things while I'm up here running my mouth and talking to you about HVAC best practices. Thanks so a lot. Any guy, any questions you got during this, we're going to try to, I'll be able to see them on the, on the screen, um, on the chat side. And, uh, I'll try to stop him at certain times and we can, uh, he can answer some questions. So yeah, we want to try to run this just like we do a class. Any of those that have ever been to any of the classes that, that, uh, Dennis or I do, you know, we work off questions and that helps us out. I realize it's going to be a little bit different doing it, doing it online. Uh, but still, you know, if there's something you want to ask, feel free. Dennis will feed me the question and we'll go from there. All right. All right. Sounds good, man. So I'd like to say good morning, everybody. This is uh, something new for the DSC university here. And uh, we're trying to get some other things together, do some other videos. Any of you that have been into our counter areas, have probably seen the videos that we're playing on our counter TVs. Uh, we're trying to do some little uh, short tech tips. Uh, Dennis is do doing a real good job with his. Uh, he is a lot more uh, skilled and versed in the videoing and editing than I am. I'm trying to learn it. So uh, I've got a couple other videos that I'm probably going to work on this afternoon so we can have some more short videos on the screens at the counter. So uh, I've done this program a few times. I also went around and did it for our counters as counter training. And one of our salesmen had asked me about a year and a half ago to put together something called HVAC best practices. And I really didn't know what, what he was after or what, you know, exactly what we wanted to do with it. So it took me a little bit of time and I finally just decided, you know, let's take, let's stick with the simple stuff. You know, just like I say, keep it simple. So I tried to just make a, a big outline of all the basic things that we need to cover when we're doing installations and startups. So that's kind of where it grew from. And along with that, I'm throwing in a few other things. And so we're going to start off today by talking about who is dealer supply company. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about my background. Like I said, I'm Wayne English, distributor service coordinator here for dealer supply company. Uh, coming up in May, I'll be with the company for 34 years. So I've been doing the, our technical service and training for since 2009. So going on 12 years now. So who is dealer supply company? DSC was founded on January 22nd, 1946. And to commemorate that, we have a new logo, a 75th anniversary logo. Uh, if any of you guys out there are old timers enough to remember back when we were on Fair Street in Atlanta, the building we were at in, on Fair Street in Atlanta actually had a water tower on top of it. So this logo kind of goes back to that uh, that water tower that was on top of that building, which is now being converted into, I believe, like loft apartments or something like that. But the water tower is still on top of the building. DSC has approximately 120 employees. DSC distributed Luxair equipment into the early 80s. When I first started working for the company, I started working part time. Uh, my father actually worked for the company and retired from the company. And so I started working part-time summers, even worked one summer up in Atlanta at the, uh, at the old building. And we used to sell Lux there, the old slant front condensing units, which you can still find a lot of them out there in the field today. Uh, we changed over to Rude in the mid eighties. So I have personally been dealing with the Rude line of equipment since the mid eighties. Uh, I did a lot of our parts ordering and technical service back years ago when I was in inside sales. So I've, I've worked with everything uh, pretty much that's Rude's had for the past 30 odd years. 
I was born in 82. So, <laughs> <laughs> so DSC has a total of 16 locations with 11 in Georgia uh, that I do technical service and training for and five in North Carolina that Dennis takes care of um, when we moved into North Carolina in 2006. Uh, a lot of our training is constantly evolving. Of course, over the last year, with the pandemic and everything that's going on, we've had to try to figure out new ways to do things. We can't bring people in and do classes like, we're, like we would normally be doing this time of year. Normally, in March and April, I'm doing classes. Dennis is doing classes. Hopefully, by late late summer, early fall, maybe we'll be back to a point where we can start doing live classes again. Yeah, we're going to do these kind of things to fill in, and hopefully they catch on, and we can continue to do this kind of stuff going on forward. Now, for any of you that want to get continuing education for this uh, presentation, I really struggled with this uh, because I know how a lot of us do these online things. We click on it, we start it, phone rings, we get up and go do something else. Next thing you know, we missed half of it or all of it. So I wanted to, put, to do something to try to make sure that you're at least there for most of it. I know, you know we're not, you're, you're not gonna sit there and listen to every word maybe, so what we decided to do was to make it a little bit more interesting. So if you want continuing education credit, what you're going to need to do is after this is over, send an email to training at dealersupply.net that comes directly to me to a separate email account I've got. And at the end of the program, I'm going to give you a code. And if you send me an email with that code in it, then I'll know you watched. I'll have your email address and I'll send you back a certificate. Sound fair enough? So that's the way we're going to work it. You know, hopefully it works out good. And this is one hour, right? This will be one hour, yes. Depending on how long we run, we may, you know, maybe 45 minutes, maybe an hour 15, but you'll get credit for one hour. I mean, yeah, credit wise. <clears throat> so let's start from the beginning. If you think about our business, heating and air, our entire business is wrapped around basically one thing, moving heat. If it's hot inside, we want to move that heat outside. Vice versa, we may want to move heat back inside. Or in the case of a gas furnace, we're creating heat and then moving that heat into the space. So the way we measure heat is with the British Thermal Unit, the BTU. This is a traditional unit of heat. It's defined as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. Heat is now known to be equivalent to energy. So working off the theme of a BTU, what is a ton of air conditioning? We all use it. We have a two-ton condenser, a three-ton condenser. We use the word ton all the time, but how does that relate to BTUs and the movement of heat? So if you go back before the era of mechanical refrigeration, ice was used for cooling. So if you imagine that we had here in the room a big one-ton block of ice, how much heat would it take to turn that ice into water? And vice versa, how much heat will we have to remove to turn that water back into a block of ice? So it takes 144 BTUs per pound of ice to change it into water. So if we have 2,000 pounds of ice, multiply that out, and that's 288,000 BTUs per day. 288,000 BTUs per day divided by 24 hours gets us to our 12,000 BTUs per hour, which we know as a ton of refrigeration. So if we work off that 12,000 BTUs per hour, and if you look at the model numbers in rude equipment for ACs and heat pumps, you'll notice that all the model numbers typically are multiples of 12 or multiples of 6,000. So uh, 24 would be a two-ton two unit, 24,000 BTUs, 30, 36, so on and so forth. So that's how all that works together, and that's how it all plays off of each other. So 12,000 BTUs per hour equals one ton of refrigeration. So moving forward into the installation process. Like I said, I came, came up with a list of items, made, a, made a, 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 a kind of a spreadsheet of things, uh, an outline, and then started working off that. So with a pre-install, sometimes that gets overlooked. You know, we just say, okay, I gotta go do this installation walk into the supply house with a two by four with some items written on it. And that's how we start our pre-installation. Not really the best way to do it. 
Uh, one thing we want to make sure that we do, especially now, as we've gotten into the higher efficiencies with 410A, expansion valves and such, we need to make sure that our equipment size correct. If we go back to old 8, 10 seer equipment, that equipment really didn't care. No. You know, you had a whole lot of room and a whole lot of slop to play with on those old 8 and 10 seer piston R22 systems. So when you're doing change outs, and I see this all the time, you go pull a three-ton unit out and you throw a three-ton unit in, it may not be the same. It's um, going to bite you now. It, very much so. I get that call all the time during the summer. You know, we took out a three-ton unit, we put a three-ton unit in, and when it gets above 90 degrees, it doesn't keep up anymore. Well, come to find out, you only got two and a half tons worth of duct work. Or, you know, something like that. Or now, the house is 25 years old, and the insulation isn't as good as it was back in the day. You know, a lot of different things like that. They, they've closed in a, 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 another room, added something else on. Everything is not always the same as it was when that equipment was originally installed. So make sure we look at the spec sheets for the equipment that we're selecting, see what the BTUs are, and then decide where we need to go from there. You know, has the home insulation been improved or has it degraded significantly? Uh, so not just replacing size for size of existing equipment, check the BTUs, and do a load calculation. Different brands have different ratings. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, one of the things Rude has worked on over the years is trying to get their nominal BTUs more up to that 24,000 or 30,000. But if you look at a lot of the spec sheets, you know, there may be one unit in that line that actually hits that number. The rest of them may be four or 5,000 BTUs short of what they actually are rated nominally as. So make sure you, you check that. You know, I've had to go out and do load calculations on older homes and then come to find out, you know, it, it, it needs more than what it, what it used to have. So let's keep that in mind. Inspecting existing duct work. I can't beat this one to death enough. I, you know, I, in every class that I talk about, at some point, I'm going to come back to duct work and airflow. I don't care what the class is. So one of the things we need to do, and it's a whole lot easier to do it before you sell the job, than it is to go back to Mr. and Ms. Homeowner and explain to them now that their existing duct work is not right and that's why their new system's not working right. We need to inspect that duct work and we need to make sure that it is suitable for the new system that we're putting in. Not just, well, it's always worked fine, that isn't always the case. So we wanna make sure we look at the duct leakage, see what the R value is of the insulation on the duct work, uh, if the blower's running in the furnace or air handler that's in there now, put it on high speed, get a digital manometer, and do a check on it. Do an uh, external duct static check. With that, you can take a look at it. You can see how much air the system's actually moving and know whether it's going to be correct for the new equipment that you're putting in. You know, it's not hard to do. It only takes a couple of minutes. I, when I go out to a job, nine times out of ten, that's the first thing I'm going to do is do a duct static test. You know, it's really easy, doesn't take long to do, and in the long run, if you go check that duct work and you find out that, you know, this three-ton system's really only moving, you know, 1,000, 1,100 CFM, maybe we need to add a supplier return, or maybe there's some problems with the duct work that, you know, that need to be addressed. We've got some flex that's crushed, things like that. So, you know, that's something you can then include in your price up front with the new equipment, instead of having to come back to the homeowner later, explain to them why things aren't working right. And yes, I'm going to. Somebody's going to say, "Well, if I add that extra into my price, I'm not going to get the job." Well, do you really want the job if you're going to have to be going back and fixing it out of your own pocket? You know, that's the kind of things you got to look at. So this is all part of the pre-install process. So another thing we got to look at really really important today is the existing line set usable yeah i understand a lot of line sets are concealed and we can't always replace them. replace as much of it as you can uh, you know flush out what's remaining i'm not so worried about a section of line set that's running down the outside of the wall if i can cut it loose in the attic cut it loose outside i can flush that part out that's going straight down an outside wall most likely there's not going to be any contamination or anything in it. Then I can run new to my unit in the attic and to my unit outside. 
make sure it's the right size for the new system. You know, I get this uh, a good bit too. You know, some of the old equipment, you know, you had, you know, five ton systems where they were running an inch and an eighth and a half inch line set. Uh, that's not going to fly today. You know, you, you look at the line sets more often than not, the line sets are going to be leaning more towards the smaller size. Yeah, exactly. Because we're trying to maintain velocity and oil movement within those lines. So if you if you put a system in, a new system in on an existing line set that's oversized, one that liquid line's too big, you're gonna overcharge the unit. Because if you get try to get the numbers to match up with the chart, you're gonna have to fill that liquid line up. And when you fill that liquid line up that's oversized, you just overcharge that system. Another thing we want to make sure we look at is you know there was a time also way on back when rude would step their line sets up and down and we don't do that anymore they would say run this many feet of of, of three or three eighths and then the balance in five sixteenths that just doesn't work anymore so sometimes a line set that's hard that's in there even though it may be may look good the insulation may be good it may be clean it's just not suitable for the new equipment so we need to make sure if that's right, because that's one of those things, if you get to a problem where you start having multiple failures and issues with that, you know, something like that, you know, could cause a problem with warranty. So we want to make sure that everything's set up and installed properly uh, from the front, from the get go. I think everybody gets hung up on just the living line. Exactly. Yeah. Suction line is crucial. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you think about it, uh, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper into that. That's, that's a really good point, Dennis. So, uh, especially with 410A refrigerant and the POE oil. The, the oil naturally mixes with the liquid refrigerant. So when the oil leaves the compressor and it's circulating through the system going out in the liquid line, that oil is just traveling along for the ride. Once that refrigerant goes through the evaporator coil and is now turned into a vapor, the oil drops out. And the only way we can get that oil back to the compressor is through velocity. That refrigerant literally has to drag that oil down the suction line and into back into the compressor. And if that suction line is too big, it's going to, the velocity of the refrigerant coming back is going to be slower, and we're going to end up with with oil traps that don't get don't work their way back to the compressor. Similar, similarly, so uh, if our line sets run right across a basement or a crawl space and it looks like a roller coaster, every one of those dips is a place where oil can accumulate. And if we do that enough, especially with, with a larger line set than we need, that's going to end up, you know, making the compressor short on oil because not all that oil is going to make it back to the compressor. So all these things can accumulate uh, and end up causing a problem for the compressor. So we need to make sure that we really look at that closely uh, and follow the proper installation instructions and sizing for our new line set. Is the electrical surface properly sized inside and out for the new system? You know, most of the time, this is not a problem. Uh, you're going to check your breaker size. You're going to look at your, your disconnect, uh, the whip that's going to the unit. Uh, you know, if that, if that looks a little suspect, you know, we probably want to replace that. But, you know, just take a look at it because, you know, unless you're, uh, let's say you're up. are going down, though. Exactly. Yeah. But let's say, let's say you're upsizing the system because they have done something to the house. They've added on or something like that. In that case, it's a good possibility you're also going to have to upgrade that electrical service. So we need to look at that and make sure that that's correct. Uh, kind of on the furnace side of things, uh, one thing, especially if we're doing a change out in a really older home, uh, even though the furnace is only hooked up to 115 volts, if we're if we're changing it out and it's in a really older home with some sketchy wiring and stuff, these new furnaces. I, I was just fixing to say these new furnaces. Brown. Yeah, yeah, you know, furnaces since uh, 1992 uh, that have electronic ignition uh, and and, and uh, flame sets. Uh, you've got to have a good ground, and you've got to have your your wire your wiring has to be phased or has to be the polarity has to be correct coming into the furnace or else it won't work. So if we've got some kind of sketchy uh, older uh, electrical service in the house, maybe they've spliced the line somewhere uh, before it gets to the furnace and we don't have a good ground and the ground's not all the way back to the, 
to the paddle as it should be, you will have some problems with uh, your furnace as far as the, uh, the hot surface ignition and the flame sense. Uh, venting. Uh, is the current vent system usable or correct for the new system? Uh, if you go in there and you take out one of these really old, you know, 100,000 BTU draft hooded furnace that probably had a, a six or a seven inch vent running on it, and you go put in today's 100,000 BTU 80% furnace on that same uh, double wall vent system, our, our current 100,000 100, BTU furnace only needs a four inch vent. If you're dumping that into a six inch vent that's going up two stories through a house, you're gonna get condensate form in that vent. It's gonna run back. It's gonna leak out the joints. You a lot of joints. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, had, I've had a number of those this, this winter talking about that. And, and even worse, it's gonna make its way back into the uh, draft induced blower, cause all kinds of issues there. Uh, so, you know, we really need to look at that uh, closely when we're changing out uh, an 80%, putting an 80% back in. Now, if we're taking an 80% furnace out and we're putting a 90 back in, you know, sometimes you could actually use that old vent if you can take it loose at the bottom and if it's running straight up through the house into the attic, sometimes you can use that old V vent as a chase to run your PVC pipe up into the attic and out the roof if you don't have the ability to run it out the sidewall. So, you know, Kind of think outside the box and make sure that uh, that you're looking at all the options when you do something like that. Uh, you know, with the 90% furnaces, uh, I'm starting to see more guys now that are taking out a 90% furnace and putting a 90% furnace back in. And they say, well, the old furnace had a two inch vent on it. I'm gonna let, and the new furnace has a two inch connector on it. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna need to run three, run two inch on that new furnace. So. There again, make sure you look at the instructions, check your length, check your number of elbows and all that type of stuff. Yeah, like I said, that's something I've been seeing more and more because of, you know, the elbows. We're getting, far, we're getting far enough down the road with 90% furnaces now that, you know, they've been in, so been some of them out there that are long enough, it's time for them to be changed out. So we really need to look at that uh, carefully too. Uh, uh, especially on the old vent system, something, something else that I've, that I've seen a number of times uh, is if, let's say that uh, it's been an outside wall and it's running across a crawl space or a basement ceiling and we don't have that PVC supported properly or within the five to six feet that the installation instructions tell us to do it. And over time, even though the 90% vent doesn't get that, doesn't get as hot as an 80%, obviously, it can get warm enough to cause that PVC to start to sag in between hangers. And it may not be much. It may only be an eighth or a quarter of an inch. But if that PVC is run across the basement or a crawl space and it has a number of sags in it because it wasn't supported properly, that's going to end up trapping condensate in the PVC pipe, which can also cause you problems, nuisance shutdowns and things like that. So take a look at all that stuff really careful. Will the new equipment fit in the current location? You know, I've been in this long enough to see this happen. Back when I started, furnaces were this tall, air handlers were this tall. You know, so when you went to do a change out, you had plenty of room to work in. Then in the early 90s, in 1992, Rude went to the 34 inch tall furnace. Rude was the first one to go to a 34 inch tall furnace and Rude still has a 34 inch tall furnace today. Uh, but Rude also went to a 35 inch air handler. So we're going from, you know, air handlers that were you know, 50 something inches tall down to a 35 inch tall air handler. Well, that's great. I got plenty of room to go in there and do a change out now. Now we're on the other side of the coin. Now that we've gotten into higher efficiency ratings and, and everything, now our air handlers are bigger again. So we're going out there and we're pulling out these 35 inch air handlers and trying to shove, you know, a 46 or 50 inch air handler back in its place. That can get a little bit sketchy sometimes. So. We need to look at that really close. If we're going from, you know, a 10 sear to a, to a 14 sear or a 10 sear to a to a 17 sear, now we've got to look at the outdoor unit and see if we've got physical space enough to get in. You know, these outdoor units are getting bigger and bigger, and especially as the efficiency rating goes up. So we've got to take a look at that really carefully. So now, 
hopefully we've gotten all that covered. We've, we've kind, of, kind of sized everything out, figured out what's going to work for us. So now we're ready to actually do the install. What's the first thing we need to do before we get ready to start the install, Dennis? Yeah. <laughs> Read the installation instructions. The I know. Knee pads. Yeah, the knee pads. Uh, uh, quite a few of the phone calls that I get involve me reading ins installation instructions. Uh, I don't have all this stuff memorized. I'm not going to pretend to have all this stuff memorized. I know where to look it up if I need to. I don't expect you to have all of it memorized. But if you're going to go put in a, a new piece of equipment that you've never installed before, whether it be, you know, a 17 sear heat pump, uh, you know, or even a 15 or 16 sear heat pump that may be different. Let's say our our 16 sear uh, two stage heat pump. First time people put it in, Dennis and I get a call. Yeah. What's this, where, where's what's this extra wire in here? Yeah. You know, do I have to wire this up? It's blue. It's common. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, if, if you're used to working with other brands of equipment that use blue as common, and you see an, ex, see an extra blue in the outdoor unit, what are you going to do with that? Uh, so make sure, you know, before you go put in a piece of equipment that you're not familiar with, when you get to the job site, that's not the time to do on-the-job training, so to speak. You should already be familiar with that and know what's going on with it before you get there. Uh, modifications to accommodate or support the new system. Do we need to make some changes with how this piece of equipment was was uh, was supported in the attic, or uh, what was it? You know, what was it uh, mounted on in the crawl space? All these types of things, uh, especially if you're in, if you're going from uh, an eighty percent to a ninety percent furnace in horizontal position. That eighty percent furnace, we only had a drain pan under the pole. You go to a you go take that out and put a ninety percent horizontal in. Now we need a drain pan under the furnace as well as the coal, because that furnace has water in it, has condensate in it. So we need to make sure that we make accommodations for uh, protecting the structure from that later on down the road. Uh, you know, just all kinds of little things like that that can come up and bite us if we're not careful to make sure we, we look at those things ahead of time. I said furnace air handler mounting and supporting, uh, furnace air handler auxiliary drain pan, outdoor unit location and pad, uh, you know, I get a lot of crazy pictures and I see a lot of crazy pictures on the internet of HVAC stuff. You know, I've seen guys, you know, we've got a condenser outside that, that died. I've literally seen pictures where the guy took the new condensing unit, sat it on top of the old dead condensing unit, hooked up the line set and wired it up. I have pictures of package units where they set a package unit beside another package unit and ducted it the new package unit into the old package unit. You know, I, I, and I, whenever I do my, my live classes, I always like to start the classes off with some of those pictures just to show people, you know, if you think that it can't be done, there's somebody that's probably already done it. So one thing on the, when you unbox it, I always say, look and see if it's damaged. Exactly. And the data plate. Yeah. Do you have a 460 volt and you're supposed to have a two, you know. That, that's, that's, that's an excellent point. And, and, and sometimes it's a case of, of, of too many people assuming something, and I'm going to give a, a, a somewhat specific, specific example for that. Uh, customer walks into the counter, walks up to, the, to, to one of our counter guys and says, I need a five-ton, three-phase unit. So the customer may be assuming that the counter guy knows what he wants. The counter guy either may be making an assumption or he may just not know because he's, he's not familiar with it enough. You tell me, you tell me you want a five ton, three phase unit, more than likely you're going to get a five ton, three phase, 230 volt unit. Unless you specifically say you want a five ton, three phase, 460 volt unit, there's a lot of assumptions to be made there. Uh, you know, that Dennis brings up an extremely good point, you know, even before you get to the job. Look at the equipment when you're loading it in your truck. I know uh, we actually have some customers that will unbox the equipment on the dock before they load it into the truck just to make sure it's not damaged, it's what it's supposed to be, and things like that. You know, that's the extreme case. Yeah. And if that's what works for you, that's great. It's just easier after before it's all. Okay. It's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a lose for everybody. 
it, whether it, whether it's whether it's it's an employee of ours that screws up and gives you the wrong piece of equipment, or you know your installer that came in and misunderstood and asked for the wrong piece of equipment. At the end of the day, if that wrong piece of equipment gets put in, everybody loses. You know now now there's more time involved in having to pull it back out. Another piece of equipment has to be has to be put back in. A lot of things like that. So, you know, let's try to try to be careful on the front end to keep those kind of things from happening uh, once we get out in the field. Uh, install, verify proper venting for the furnace, whether it's 80% or 90% furnace. Uh, on a 90%, uh, configure the drain assembly for furnace orientation. You know, Rude changed their 90 plus furnaces several years ago, and they completely changed the configuration of the condensate drain assembly and I was scared to death because they came out and said okay you can put you can install this furnace in eight different configurations and you have to have a kit if you go to this configuration you have to have a kit if you go to this configuration and there's you know 10 steps to changing the furnace over from upflow to horizontal and I'm just sitting here thinking about all the ways this thing can be screwed up and amazingly enough Rude did such a good job on their installation instructions and pictures that I would say that, that in a high 90% range, guys are able to install and convert these furnaces over to horizontal, left hand, right hand, whatever, whatever um, of the configurations they, they decide to do with no problems. And my calls have went down on that. Yeah, I still get and, I, and I'll tell you. Uh, and this, this goes back to reading the instructions before you put something in you've never put in before. I can tell you the first mistake that almost every contractor is going to make when they install one of our 90% horizontal furnaces in, from, and convert it from the upflow to the horizontal position. When you do that, you have to remove the drain trap assembly from its upflow location and you install it hanging out the, the bottom of the furnace, which was the side, now it's the bottom of the furnace. And there's a hole in the back of that uh, drain trap assembly that was connected to the collector box. Inside the horizontal kit, there is a plug that's just a little bit over a half inch in diameter that has to go into that hole. And almost without fail, the first time somebody installs one of these that has to be converted to horizontal, they'll forget to put that plug in. It shows it clearly on the instructions, but it's a tiny little, little detail and if you don't put that plug in, that furnace will not work. It'll come on, it'll run, and you'll get a water sense error. And then, then we got to figure out what's going on. And what happens is the drain trap's there for a reason. The furnace operates uh, in a negative pressure situation inside the heat exchanger. So when that plug is left out, the purpose of the drain trap is to keep air from getting sucked back up into the heat exchanger. So when that plug is left out, it allows air to bypass the trap, go into the heat exchanger, and it will allow the water to drain out. So very important that we remember to put that drain or that uh, plug in the condensate assembly when we're converting it from upflow to horizontal. Talked about the electrical. Most likely, I mean, if we're, taking, if we're changing out a 15, 20 year old piece of equipment, it's just a good idea to change the disconnect and, and, and whip electrical connections to make sure that we don't have any excessive resistance in our in our disconnect. If it's a if it's a breaker style disconnect that the breaker hadn't gotten weakened over the years, the old pull plug disconnects. Half the time, on, if you're going out to an old piece of equipment, you try to pull the pull plug out, and the disconnect wants to come off the wall. You know, make sure we get all that cleaned up. <clears throat> Back to the line set again. You know, I'm going to tell you, just like I told you a minute ago, flush the line set if we got to reuse any of the existing line set. Now, when I say flush the line set, is that using pro flush? Is that using nitrogen? You know, whatever the case may be, at the end of the day, you need to do what, what you need to do to make sure that that line set is clean enough so that you're protecting that new equipment that you're putting in. The manufacturer recommends replacement of line set when you're changing from 22 to 410A. Period. End of story. Now, like I said, I know we can't always do that, but that's the manufacturer's recommendation. 
you know, we sell speedy channel to go down the outside of the building. Uh, Dennis and I were just talking about uh, mini splits the other day. We sell a ton of mini splits today. Uh, just like I've been saying for years, mini splits are going to be continuing and continuing to gain popularity. Yeah. And the majority of times we're putting them in an existing uh, structure and we have to run that line set outside exposed. Speedy channel works great. I put a mini split in my shop two years ago, ran speedy channel on the outside of it. Looks great, works great, you know, protects the line set, protects the electrical lines, all that type of stuff. This is another really important one. Uh, and this is one of those things that if you remember a statement I made earlier where I said that uh, the old 810 serial equipment, it didn't care. You could go slap it in and it would run all day long and it really didn't care how careful you were in the installation process. Uh, once we got to 12 sear was kind of about the, the, the point where things really started getting more and more critical. Uh, and now that we're at the point we're at with uh, the 14 sear and higher equipment, uh, uh, 410A and specifically that we're using POE oil. If you don't braze with nitrogen, you're probably going to have issues. Uh, so the point of brazing with nitrogen is to make sure that we displace the oxygen in the refrigerant circuit. A chemical reaction happens when you braze copper. When you heat copper up and oxygen is present, that, uh, that, that copper and that oxygen are going to react with each other and form copper oxide. That's that black soot that forms on the surface of the copper. So if we're brazing a joint, whether it be to the service valve or brazing the coil in, uh, if you're brazing that joint and there is oxygen inside the lines, the inside of those lines are going to form uh, copper oxide. That's been happening for years. Yeah. Ever since we started doing heating and air, that's always been happening. And we should have always been brazing with nitrogen. R22 with mineral oil didn't give a crap. Right. It didn't care at all. Now with POE oil, uh, POE oil has another characteristic. Remember I talked about POE oil likes to, is going, is going to flow with the uh, liquid refrigerant just like mineral oil. But POE oil is also a solvent. solvent. So as soon as you start that system up, any of that copper oxide that's on the inside of the lines is going to be flushed out, washed away, or if you didn't flush the line set out good and reuse the line set, especially if it had a burnout before, that POE oil is going to take it. It's going to clean that line set out for you really nicely, <laughs> take all that crud and shut it right into the expansion valve. And believe me, I have looked at a lot of expansion valves, opened up a lot of them, cut so far, and looked at the crud that gets inside an expansion valve, and most of the time it's because of copper oxide and not properly brazing. Uh, That's what our dryer's for, right? Yeah. <laughs> here, here, here's, here's, the, here's the way I, I, I explain that. So Dennis brings up a good point. We've got a dryer in the system. We, we, when we went to 410A, you know, every system gets a dryer from the get-go. Even You know, it's even shipped from the manufacturer. The problem is, once that, uh, once that oil picks up the, the copper oxide, it just flows right through the, uh, the desiccant in, the, in the, uh, the, the dryer. The dryer is there to pull moisture out. Dryer. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a strainer, it's, you know, it's not a filter as such like that. And as long as that, that, that uh, copper oxide is, is entrained in the oil, the oil just passes right through with it. So that's one of the things that we have to be careful about and uh, make sure that we don't uh, make that worse. Uh, talking about the dryer, uh, another characteristic of POE oil is it, it attracts moisture and the moisture bonds with the POE oil. And I don't care how good you pull a, a vacuum on that system, even though we do need to pull a good vacuum, it's not gonna pull the moisture out of the oil. When the oil goes through the dryer, the dryer, the desiccant within the dryer will pull that moisture out of the oil. So that's another thing to keep in mind with POE oil going forward. 
Evacuation to 500 microns. That's 29.9 inches of vacuum. Back many, many years ago, when I used to do installs, uh, we hooked up a, we hooked up a vacuum pump. We had our analog gauges, and we would let it run until the needle got down somewhere below zero. I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and we, we called that a good vacuum. So here's what the difference is. You know, if you look at your needle on your on your, your analog gauge, it goes down to 29 inches. So we need to get to 29.9 inches. 29.92 inches is absolute vacuum. We're not going to get there. 29 inches, we're still at 25,000 microns. So it's that point that that point nine two inches or that point nine zero inches that gets us from 25,000 microns down to a 500 micron vacuum. That you know, when we get down to that point, that's where all the work is really being done. So it's you know, of course. Uh, with digital micron gauges, digital gauge sets. It's a lot easier to do that today, but the old putting the pump on it and going smoking a cigarette or eating lunch and coming back is not necessarily good enough to uh, make ensure that we pull the proper vacuum. Well, the factory says, what, hold for 10, 15 minutes? Yeah, you know, if, we're, if you're doing triple, you know, you know the, 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 the idea of doing a full triple evacuation, you pull your vacuum, you hold it, you break it with a refrigerant, Pull it again and repeat until the third time. So, you know, like I say, you know, we need to be more careful about about vacuums, especially uh, since the equipment today is so much more sensitive to contamination uh, and other issues that can cause problems with it. Uh, and like I said, and I'm going to say it again, you know, that old eight ten sear equipment, it didn't give a crap. You could get by with everything. You had this much room for error. Equipment nowadays, you got about this much room for error doesn't take much to cause a problem with, with current equipment. So once we've got all that done, we planned out our job. We've gone through everything step by step. We've installed the equipment. We've got everything hooked up and ready to go. And now it's time to start up the AC. Are the indoor and outdoor conditions suitable for startup and charging? You know, if that house has been down and you're doing a change out and that house hasn't had air conditioning in it for a couple of days, and it's been 90 something degrees and it's high 80s, low 90s degrees in the house, we're going to start the equipment up, but we're not going to sit there and try to fine tune the charge, try to go through everything, get it exactly right. You know, Mr. and Miss homeowner may be complaining, you know, that they want their house down to 72 degrees before they go to bed. Probably not going to happen, especially if we got a lot of humidity in the house. So if you try to spend a lot of time, dialing in that charge and working on that system when it's that hot inside the house, you're wasting your time. You're gonna have to come back and do it again once the house gets down, gets gets acclimated to the proper conditions. New construction. Yeah, you know, new construction startups, things like that. Uh, you know, the manufacturer says that the indoor conditions should be between 70, 75 degrees when we do a startup and get ready to actually, you know, get our, get our charge dialed in. Uh, I used to say, you know, I used to go through the whole, the whole spiel of, you know, you measure the length of your line set. The units today come charged for 15 foot of line set. So if I've got a 50 foot line set, that means I've got 35 extra feet. If I've got a three eighths inch liquid line, that means I need to add six tenths of an ounce of refrigerant for each one of those 35 feet. I don't tell you that today. Start it up with, a, unless we got something really extreme, start it up with the charge that's in it let it run, get the conditions to where they need to be. Then we can come back and we can adjust that charge if we need to, because I'm fine. I found more and more. If we go through that whole process of adding that additional refrigerant in, a lot of times we may have to come back and pull some of it out, especially with air handlers that are laying on the right hand airflow side. There's something about the configuration of the end coils that Rude uses in their air handlers. Uh, that when you lay that coil on its right hand side, the air doesn't flow through it exactly the same, the refrigerant doesn't flow through the coil exactly the same, and more times than not, you'll be pulling refrigerant out of that system instead of adding more in. Downflow too. Yeah. 
big jump on some and, of them. And, and, that, and, and, and I, I don't see that many downflow right. systems. So, like so, but yeah, but, but if you look at the charging chart, they lump, they, they, they categorize downflow and right hand airflow together. Right. So, yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. Uh, set blower speed for appropriate static and AC size. Uh, a few years ago, when Rude went to the new uh, the new platform of the gas furnaces with the quarter turn latches and, and all that, uh, we had some changes in the blower taps. Uh, we're carrying a seventy five thousand furnace with a four ton blower, so I went to went you know we we got our heads together and we made up these nice neon I believe they were like neon green stickers, and we put them on all the furnace boxes and said. Here are your different blower speeds for for each different tonnage of, of what air conditioner you may be you know installing with this furnace, and it's like I just tried to recreate the wheel. I got so many calls about that with guys wanting to know how to change the, the the blower to the proper speed. I'm like, this is something you should have been doing on every furnace you've installed. You know, unless you're unless you're only installing, you know, three ton drive furnaces and three ton units, or five ton drive furnaces and five ton units. Every other installation you did, you should have changed the blower speed. If you put in a 75 with a three-ton blower and you've got a two-ton unit on it, you need to change the blower speed. So that's something that I also find doesn't, doesn't happen, doesn't get done. Uh, I go out to a job and check the blower speed and find out, you know, we've got a four-ton unit on a 100,000 furnace and the blower still set to, five ton, to, to the five-ton speed uh, and we're just blasting the air across the coil too fast. And we're trying to move too much air for the duct system if, right. we, if we've got a four-ton system. So, I mean, it's just, it causes so many other problems. Verify charge. Only adjust if indoor conditions are appropriate. I pretty much covered that one. Uh, Subcooling and superheat. You know, charging a expansion valve system, we're going to be going by subcooling. Roots charts that are on the inside of the door of every condensing unit and heat pump that they make gives, gives us subcooling numbers. You know, ballpark, eight to 10 degrees subcooling. But if you're gonna look at the charts on some of these and you're gonna see subcooling numbers that may be 10, 15, 18, depending on the conditions. So make sure you look at the chart and determine the right, proper amount of subcooling when you install that and, and do a startup on that system. Superheat, if everything's working right, the expansion valve is going to take care of the superheat for us. That doesn't, yeah. mean, doesn't mean we don't need to check it. Always look at it. Yeah, because if we look at it and we see that superheat is way out in the left field for some reason, that may be an early indicator that we've got something else going on. Do we have a problem with the TXV? More than likely, we probably have a problem with airflow. Things like that uh, will give us an idea. Uh, temperature difference across the evaporator coil. I mean, this is about as HVAC 101 as you can get. You know, measure your supply air temperature, measure your return air temperature, see what your drop is across the evaporator coil. You know, too many times guys call me on the phone and we're knee deep into trying to figure out a problem and I'll ask them what their temperature drop is across the coil and they haven't even been in the house yet. I don't know, I'm out here, you know, we get, get, uh, we get fixated on our, on our gauges and on something the outdoor unit may be doing, and we don't think to go check the other things. Um, and I'm, I'm the same, I can do the same way. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've gone out to a job with a contractor, and whether we figured the problem out or not, or whether we, we, we thought we got it figured out, I, as soon as I get in my truck and get about 10 miles down the road, I will remember something yeah. that I should have checked. I usually call you and say, you know, yep. what, I forgot to check. Exactly. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's just, it, we get, sometimes we get so focused on trying to, to, to do this that we can't see the forest from the trees. So, and that's something I, I encourage guys to have, is have a startup checklist. You know, we have a job site information sheet that I, that I give out to contractors when, when, uh, when they're having a problem or multiple failures. And part of the purpose of that job site information sheet is just so you go check everything. I, you know, just, you know, I don't care if, if, if you if you think that everything else is working right, you may go check something and, and find something that, you know, just didn't occur to you. Hopefully you check the duct static on, 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 the, on the duct work before you pull the old equipment out. You put the new equipment in, recheck the duct static on the new system. Check the blower performance chart and then make sure that we're set to the proper blower speed. 
Now, if you really want to get detailed about it, perform a capacity calculation. You know, I've had to do this a number of times when I go out on a job. It takes a little bit longer because now we've got to get, we've got to make sure we do our wet bulb and dry bulb uh, temperatures on our supply and return. Uh, we have to use our total heat chart to make that make those calculations. Uh, here's the formula. I'm not going to get into that. That's that, that, you know, we could do a whole other class, and we may do a whole other class just on just on calculating uh, you capacity. Can, you can do all <laughs> Record the model and serial numbers of the equipment installed. Uh, you know, you're going to have it on your on your paperwork when you when you get the equipment from us. Uh, hopefully, you're going to put it on on your your invoice you give to the homeowner. But if it's a new construction house, you know, I don't know how what happens with those model numbers and serial numbers uh, when that's taken care of. And especially now that we've gotten to so far into the point of registering equipment online for our extended warranty to 10 years. One of the calls that I get from the factory or emails that I get from the factory on a regular basis is I've got a customer who's trying to register a piece of equipment and it shows that one of your customers has already registered that piece of equipment. And the reason being is because somebody didn't record the model numbers and serial numbers or they went off uh, where it was written down on an invoice or something and somebody transposed a couple of numbers and didn't look at the numbers that were actually on the piece of equipment, sometimes maybe we ship two systems out to your shop. One system's supposed to go to this job. The other system's supposed to go to this job. Systems go where they're supposed to. Model numbers and serial numbers don't. They end up getting, getting registered wrong. I've had that happen before. So take a picture of it. You know, Make sure you've got it recorded properly exactly what it is. With the air handler, we want to make sure we check our electric heat operation. Uh, you know, get everything up, get everything started up and going. Set it for emergency heat. Check our amp draw. Those types of things. Uh, we want to look at auxiliary mode, emergency mode, defrost. Like I say, check the amp draw, electric heat operation. Something I didn't put in here that that, uh, that occurred to me uh, afterwards. I should probably go back and add another bullet point. When you get to the 17 seer and 20 seer communicating equipment, those air handlers don't know what heat strips are going to be installed with them. So you actually have to go into the EcoNet controller and you have to tell that EcoNet controller how many KW you installed in that air handler. It will not work. <laughs> exactly. If you don't go, if you don't take that step and tell the EcoNet controller how many KW are in that air handler, as far as that system's concerned, it has no electric heat whatsoever. And so then when it gets into colder weather or the system has a problem and they have to go to emergency heat, the homeowner is going to have no heat at all. So that's an important step to remember when you're putting in 17 sear and 20 sear equipment. Is the coil draining proper? You know, make sure we've got the coil, you know, we've got a little bit of pitch on it. Probably the most, most, the most times I get this question about a coil not draining properly is usually when an air handler is converted from upflow to horizontal right-hand airflow where you have to pull that coil out and flip it around in the cabinet. When you pull that coil out and flip it around in the cabinet, sometimes you can get things a little cockeyed in there and it may not want the drain as good as it should. Static too high also. Static too high with, you know, with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with an air handler, it's a draw-through coil. If I've got too much return static, that's going to make that air, the velocity of that air go through that coil so fast, it'll actually strip the water off the coil. It'll actually, even though we may have a trap, and I've had some guys at, at some other locations uh, tell me that on four and five ton units, they actually put a one inch, instead of three quarter inch PVC coming off the unit, they actually use a one inch drain trap, one inch diameter drain trap, so they can get more water in there to keep from sucking air back up through our drain. And of course, a condensate pump if needed. When we get to a startup on a gas furnace, I know most guys will go out there and they're gonna, they're gonna flip the switch, turn it on heat mode, and burn the oil off the heat exchanger. I mean, that's standard, easy to do. You at least know the furnace fired up, but that's not doing a proper startup on a gas furnace. First, Obviously, we've already, we're going to know whether it's going to be natural or LP gas. If it is an LP gas situation, we're going to get a conversion kit. We're going to install that conversion kit for LP gas in the furnace. 
we need to check and set the inlet and manifold gas pressures on that gas furnace, whether it's LP or whether it's natural. And no, they don't set it at the factory. They set it at the factory, but there can be variations in the field with your gas supply that may cause that regulator in that uh, gas valve to not be set to the proper outlet pressure. Uh, so make sure we take a look at that uh, when we get ready to do it after we have a couple of job site visits here lately where natural gas, the gas valve was four or five inches. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and which was over fire for, 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 yeah, for whatever the case may be, you know, so that, that's one of the things we need to look at and, uh, very carefully. Uh, here's one that I get, have gotten more and more as, as, as the, we've gotten into the uh, current model uh, gas furnaces it is checking the temperature rise across the heat exchanger uh, the main limits on these gas furnaces are set so low because they're trying to squeeze so much out of the combustion products that you know back in the day with the old furnaces when you could have a you know a 60 or 70 degree rise across the heat exchanger now we're usually looking at 30 to 50 or so degree rise across the heat exchanger. So if you've got a 50 degree rise, you're trying to maintain 70 degrees in the space, that's gonna put you at a supplier temperature around 120 degrees. If we've got a restricted duct system, even worse. Zoning. Zoning. <laughs> I couldn't get the words out of my mouth fast enough, Dennis. Zoning. Got zoning, we're dumping that hot bypass back into the return especially if we've got lopsided zone sizes, you're gonna trip the main limit. Well, our motors are changing. So yeah. when we're uh, doing zoning now, and that variable speed or constant torque is pushing yeah. harder. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's something. The PSC didn't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it didn't as much. Right, as much. Yeah, so <laughs> so zoning is a compromise anyway. That furnace and that, air, that single stage air conditioning system is designed to operate at one capacity, basically. So when we start trying to make it, make it, you know, only put this much air here, only put this much air here, now we're compromising that system and you're gonna have those nuisance issues. A lot of times I have to go out and adjust the bypass damper, move to where the bypass damper dumps back into the return, make sure it's farther away from the, from the return plenum, even start, even crack the dampers open with the Honeywell dampers that we have, they have those preset stops on them. So you can go in there and adjust those dampers to where that damper never closes 100%. So we're always bleeding some air off into other zones. That's just- Another a, class. That's that's another class and that, but that start, that's part of the startup process. That should, it should be done at startup, not after the system's been in and the homeowner's complaining because the furnace keeps cutting off all limit. Uh, verify the temperature rise range is up as, as stated on the data plane. If we look at the model number and serial number plate in the furnace, it will give you a uh, proper temperature rise range. So we should be somewhere in the middle of that rise range. If we're up towards the high end of it, that's going to indicate an airflow issue. <clears throat> on 90 plus furnaces, verify proper drain configuration and operation. I think I covered that pretty good with uh, talking about the uh, moving around the uh, drain trap assembly uh, when we were setting up our furnace horizontal. So we've just about reached an hour here. Uh, how many people do we get? Do we have? It shows 19, Okay, but, but whenever you stop recording, you usually pops up one. Yeah. So no questions right now. So hopefully everybody's, you know, enjoyed this. Hopefully you picked up a little bit of something from it and we can you know, Dennis and I can both learn and move on from this and, and get a little better at it and do some more of the little, the little short videos I talked about doing. So many of you that are out there watching and listening, if you want to get your continuing education credit, here's what you got to do. Send an email to training at dealersupply.net. That comes directly to me to a separate email account that I have and include this code in the email, 012246. That's 012246 on an email to training at dealersupply.net. And then I will have your email address, obviously. I'll print you out or make you a PDF of a certificate. 
and I'll email it directly back to you. So if you need continuing education credit, email the training at dealersupply.net, include this code, you can put it in the subject line, you can put it in the body of the email, 012246. The root app, if you don't have it, that's something that, that, uh, that you can get that will help you out with the equipment. Uh, it has a scan tool in there where you can scan the model numbers and serial numbers of the equipment uh, and pull up the information, pull up all spec sheets, installation instructions, and all that good stuff. Uh, it has a section called product technical support. I use that all the time when I'm at my desk. So that can also help you uh, pulling up technical information on the equipment when you're out in the field. On the equipment, look, here's a furnace. Uh, there's an outdoor unit. It says right here, scan here for model information. There's our QR code. You're going to see a lot of these squares on the equipment. You're looking for the one that has the, the three squares in the corners. That's the actual QR code. You'll see other squares on the equipment and on the parts. Those are, are, are scan codes that the factory uses for internal use. Uh, same thing on the outdoor units there on the model number and serial number plate. So if you scan that, and I've even noticed on, on the new phones, if you just take your, if you just go to your camera on your phone and you, you, you point the camera at that, it it, web, it'll yeah. scan it and it'll take you to the web. It'll take you back, back here. Uh, this is of course the app which go, goes to the web, but it'll take you back here and take you to that information for that piece of equipment, model number, serial number, spec sheet, installation instructions and all that. So, you know, those are the kind of things that we want to make sure that we're familiar with. Uh, I appreciate all of you that, that are out there and have joined us today. Uh, like I say, if you want, need your continuing education credit, email me and I'll get it to you. I appreciate Dennis coming yep. coming from, from North Carolina down here so we can work on this first one together, kind of get our, get our act together and make sure we know what we're doing. Uh, like I said, we'll be doing some more short videos that'll be playing on our, our counter TVs for you when you come into our, to our counter locations. I appreciate it. You got anything else you want to say or throw in there, Dennis? No, I mean, if anybody got any questions, they can throw them up now. But. Yeah, that, that, or you can always, when you send me your email, you can always send me an email to that same email address if you've got any questions that you think of afterwards, just like Dennis and I said. As soon as we get in the truck and we're about 10 miles down the road, we think of something we should have asked or something we should have looked at. You know, in about an hour or so when you're eating lunch, you'll think of something that I said that'll, that'll, that'll give you a question. So shoot me an email. Thanks a yep. lot, guys, and look forward to, to, to a good summer, hopefully, as we move forward. Thanks a lot. See ya.